Good afternoon and welcome to Making Giving Social. My name is Howard Lake, I publish the UK fundraising website and this afternoon we have two hours of panel discussion and questions and answers session um, on what makes social giving successful. We're very lucky to have some expert and experienced speakers in the room um, and a whole group of fundraisers, marketers and communications people from charities. So we should get some very useful advice it's also the launch to the UK charity sector of Giving Tuesday in the UK, which is a very, very successful event that is now working around the world to promote charitable giving. And I'm particularly pleased to see that launching in the UK. Um, you'll hear far more about it later on today. Um, our panel today consists of Henry Timms, who is founder of, co-founder of Giving Tuesday and director of 92Y, who has kindly flown in from New York for today. We've got Aaron Eccles, who is Senior Social Media Manager of Cancer Research UK, Dominic Vallely, Chief Executive of The Giving Lab, and Gareth Ellis-Thomas, Head of Digital Prostate Cancer UK. So a whole group of very useful, experienced fundraisers in this room, and a very important day. Um, I've, Henry will be able to give you more information about the launch this morning uh, to corporate supporters, but I'm hoping you'll find a lot about Giving Tuesday today. You can follow what's going on apart from watching this online, so welcome to all our visitors who are watching online and via the live stream. You can find out a lot more via the Giving Tuesday website and the Giving Tuesday UK hashtag. I'd like to thank Blackboard Europe for hosting us today in their sunny offices on the banks of the River Thames in London and also to Charities Aid Foundation for making today possible. So I'd like to invite Henry Timms to tell us about Giving Tuesday. Henry. Uh, thank you, Howard. So we begin, uh, we have uh, a video to show you to kick things off. So that was the, uh, the video made by some of the folks uh, working in the US. My name's Henry Timms. I want to thank uh, uh, Blackboard and CAF for the opportunity to be here and to welcome all of you to Giving Tuesday 
uh, UK. I run the 92nd Street Y, uh, uh, an organisation in New York City, a community centre and cultural centre in New York. And one of our uh, real thoughts as we began Giving Tuesday was to say, as we look at the world and we think about uh, Black Friday, uh, Black Friday which came to the UK in a big way last year for the first time, and Cyber Monday, and Cyber Monday last year was I think over £500 million processed online to retail and became the biggest uh, retail online giving day of the season. As we think about Black Friday and we think about Cyber Monday, uh, our organisation began thinking, well, what about Giving Tuesday? What about after two days that are good for the economy, a day which would be good for the soul? A day when just as the way the retail world has come together to tell a shared story and collective narrative around Black Friday or Cyber Monday, how could the philanthropic community come together and tell uh, many different stories, but all under one overarching theme and one umbrella, which of course was hashtag Giving Tuesday. Uh, as, a, as an Englishman in New York, it's a special pleasure that Giving Tuesday launches here in the UK today. Um, we began this in the US, and what we've begun to see, I'll talk a bit about, is Giving Tuesday moving around the world because of a lot of uh, really well-intentioned and well-connected people who have grabbed the central idea of Giving Tuesday and said, we can make this work for us too. So I want to thank all the people who have got us to today in Growing Giving Tuesday. So I want to dig a bit deeper this afternoon on Giving Tuesday to talk a little bit about what we've learned from the campaign, um, what we think is going to be big for this year, and, and I hope what is helpful for you, both for the organisations here in the room and for people watching via live stream. So we'll start with some data points. Uh, we had 10,000 partners last year. In the US, that was about 8,300 about 1,700 partners around the world. Online giving went up by 90%. Uh, that's the Blackboard number. It's pleased, nice to be here at Blackboard. That they measured a 90% increase on the day itself. A really interesting figure, I thought, was a 40% increase in average gift size. So people actually, uh, it seemed, were giving more on Giving Tuesday, responding to this kind of shared story. Uh, 1.2 billion media impressions, 500,000 tweets. And what was interesting when we looked at the US data, this was year one of Giving Tuesday. We've been doing this for 20 months now. So year one of Giving Tuesday, the top blue line is Black Friday, uh, the middle red line is Cyber Monday, and the uh, promising yellow line is Giving Tuesday. That was year one um, of, of, of what we were doing. And if you consider that that's a movement started um, by the philanthropic sector in the US, the other two lines, the much bigger lines, have been supported by commercial worlds. Uh, we really thought that showed some good progress. And then last year, this is Cyber Monday and Giving Tuesday, and actually uh, looking at Twitter, uh, we actually had more tweets about Giving Tuesday than Cyber Monday last year. So the conversation on social was actually more about Giving Tuesday than Cyber Monday in year two. We think that's a very promising idea and we'll come on to why. But what I'm gonna talk about today is just some of the things we saw over the last 20 months as we built the Giving Tuesday campaign. And remember that Giving Tuesday is a movement and it was designed as a movement. So we were never being very prescriptive about what we had to do. We simply wanted to increase and deepen giving. So whether that was kids uh, at home talking with their families about the importance of philanthropy, whether it was volunteering, whether it was major financial gifts, the thinking was always the same, which is how can all of these stories about value and philanthropy come together under one centralizing principle and centralizing umbrella. So here are just some of the campaigns which stood out for us. This is Phoenix House, and Phoenix House in, uh, in the US, they help uh, people who are in recovery. Um, often with addiction problems, and people with addiction problems are often estranged from their families. So what Phoenix House did for Giving Tuesday was put together this template letter well in advance of Giving Tuesday, and they said simply, write a letter of support and encouragement for someone who is struggling with their recovery and is working on their recovery. And then they issued all of these letters on Giving a Tuesday itself. So we heard some extraordinary stories from Phoenix House about how the power of letter writing was one way of telling a story about value on Giving Tuesday. Uh, this is a group of pilots across the US last year. So uh, 400 pilots gave $25 each to create a scholarship fund to give disabled people uh, their chance to fly airplanes through the freedom of flight. And this is the Methodist Church. So the Methodist Church last year, these figures are worth repeating, I think, um, they had 11,000 donors from 32 countries, 16,000 gifts, 880 partners um, for more than $6.5 million raised online on Giving Tuesday last year. The Methodist Church, the biggest online giving day before Giving Tuesday, raised 400000 So they went from 400000 to $6.5 million. Really interesting, I think, particularly for charities here in the room, they did a lot of clever work around incentives. How do you use incentives to engage a donor base? Interesting, too, this is a, quite an old donor base. 
a lot of the, the, the Methodists actually reported A, a lot of new donors, and B, a lot of donors over 60 who were becoming digital donors for the first time. I think those are powerful trends as we think about our campaigns. The second thing we saw with Giving Tuesday, which was great, was user-generated content. So again, we have a movement mindset with Giving Tuesday. What we're trying to do is not own Giving Tuesday, but let the community create parts of it. So this was created by a designer who liked the idea of Giving Tuesday and started creating collateral and sending it in to us at Giving Tuesday Central. We then shared it with all of our partners. So you saw these kinds of cool things beginning to happen online. And we also saw a lot of learning beginning. So this is Stanford Social Innovation Review. Um, in, in the US, Stanford University really is the leader in thinking about particularly philanthropy and civil society and how those things are changing in the world. And they hosted a series of webinars uh, for nonprofits in the US about how they could get the best out of Giving Tuesday. So this wasn't being hosted by us, the 92nd Street Y. This is be hosted by third parties who are grabbing a piece of Giving Tuesday and saying, I can make this whole movement better by what I'm doing today. I was just checking Twitter before uh, I came into this session, and there are events being planned in Oklahoma and New York City and Brazil, none of which are run by every, anyone at Giving Tuesday Central, but all of which are designed to help grow the movement further. So what we're beginning to see with Giving Tuesday is these kind of user-generated content actually driving the whole movement, not just to raise more money or more volunteering, but actually get smarter about what giving is and why it matters. And then this was probably the best piece of user-generated content last year, which was the Google homepage, um, where we had a you know, hashtag join Giving Tuesday, Google worked with Mashable, uh, the social media platform and leaders, to create their first ever online hangout-a-thon. So on Giving Tuesday last year, they actually did an all-day long hangout featuring lots of different nonprofits and celebrities, telling stories about nonprofits, what they did, what they achieved, and why it matters, and raising Chris Call funds for different organizations. So if those were some of the great user-generated moments, uh, here are three of the surprises. Uh, does anyone know who this is? This is going to be hard for a UK audience. It's pretty hard for a US audience. This is the mayor of Batesville in Arkansas. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't get that. Um, so the mayor of Batesville in Arkansas, we, we had plans uh, to, uh, I won't name names, but we certainly had a plan of one particular mayor who might be the best first mayor in the country to declare at Giving Tuesday, uh, us being in New York City. And we had a press release written saying Mayor X declares at Giving Tuesday in New York City. Uh, and of course, the day before that press release was announced, we saw this via social media. Um, so the first mayor in America to announce Giving Tuesday was the mayor of Batesville, Arkansas. And what's so interesting about that from our perspective was any other campaign you've ever worked on, if someone steals your thunder and announces it before you, you're thinking this is a disaster. This meant this was going in the right direction because what was beginning to happen was that the movement was actually scaling away from us having begun the movement and going into the hands of the people we really wanted to be moving it forward. Uh, this was another good example. Everyone knows this. This is a uh, photo bomb. Uh, last year, we saw the invention of the conference bomb. So if a photo bomb is sneaking in the back of a picture, a conference bomb is someone speaking at a conference instead of the thing they're supposed to be speaking about, about why Giving Tuesday is good for the world. Uh, so this lady here is speaking at a financial services conference, and she's supposed to be talking about balanced scorecard accounting. Instead, she gave a presentation on why she thought Giving Tuesday was a cool thing. So well, again, what we're learning from this, uh, which I think is the theme of what I'm talking about this morning, is the big lesson from Giving Tuesday is how have we as charities and organizations shared agency with other people? How have we stopped seeing ourselves as the only voice, the only people in control, the only people of power, and actually said these movements will be stronger when they get further away from this? Uh, and this is perhaps the best example of that. So one thing we did with Giving Tuesday in the US last year, which I think will be replicated again in the UK this year, was put together a toolkit so people could pitch themselves to local TV. So local nonprofits around the US could actually pitch themselves to local producers and say, I've got a story to tell about my organization on Giving Tuesday. Uh, this is Jesse Sheldon, who's 19 years old, who was on two different media shows in Washington last year. But on Giving Tuesday last year, 50 different people uh, from different nonprofits across the country successfully pitched themselves onto local TV to tell stories about their organization, why it mattered on Giving Tuesday, and what people could do to support them. I think a big opportunity as we think about Giving Tuesday UK this year. Uh, and then three really nice communities, so three uh, powerful communities for us. Uh, this was Baltimore. So in Baltimore last year, the whole city came together uh, with the goal of raising $5 million under 
they renamed Giving Tuesday Be More Gives More, so Baltimore Gives More. Again, really interesting, right? If you were thinking about the way we'd think about this even five years ago, you'd say they've changed the title, this is the wrong logo, we must call our lawyers. But what's really good about this, of course, is they've taken it and they've owned it. They've turned Giving Tuesday into something which is about them and their organisation. They made it Be More Gives More. This is the mayor of Baltimore and they got the whole community of businesses, government, non-profit, local people to raise uh, almost $6 million in one day to support local people in Baltimore. Uh, and where we really uh, were surprised to see Giving Tuesday grow was around the world. So this was in Zimbabwe last year uh, at an orphanage where they had a local uh, community day when everyone got together to help repair and support the local orphanage. And this was in Latin America last year uh, where they turned Giving Tuesday into Undia Parada. Uh, and this is a young man pledging to give his PlayStation to a local children's hospital. So what we began to see with this was this idea of kind of Giving Tuesday is what you see is a sense of people grabbing it, turning it into something that works for them and making it their own. We're expecting to see a lot of that as Giving Tuesday grows in the UK this year. Uh, three great tweets we liked from the campaign. Uh, number one, uh, Giving Tuesday is trending above HBO, Christmas and Amazon on Twitter. We thought that was a lot of fun. Uh, number two, the, the White House got behind Giving Tuesday in, in, a, in a big way. I'm pleased to say that the Cabinet Office here in the UK has already become a formal partner of Giving Tuesday, uh, and we're really excited by the way in which government is encouraging this, uh, not leading it. And then finally, Bill Gates uh, and the Gates Foundation were big supporters of Giving Tuesday last year, and we look forward to their return this year as they spread the message, which is really clear, really important to them as an organisation, um, that giving is about really intentional and impactful giving, and we think more carefully about that. So we saw some big names, we saw some, uh, some pretty big numbers, and we saw some pretty big impact, but we also saw some real creativity. And one thing I think that the UK charitable sector uh, is really well known for is how creative and uh, inventive it can be. And here are three good examples of the kind of creativity we saw around Giving Tuesday. So this is Dress for Success, uh, who are an organisation who help women who are re-entering the workforce often after challenging times with uh, clothing and shoes for job interviews. Uh, and instead of Giving Tuesday, they renamed it Giving Shoes Day, a day when you would give shoes back, and they had a campaign around shoes donation across the country. Uh, this is the Case Foundation, uh, who worked with organisations including CrowdRise and lots of different charities. And actually what they did was a very big matching challenge. And one of the things we really saw work with Giving Tuesday last year, and I think this is a good tip for charities, is if you can get matching funds together in advance, A, you've already raised money against Giving Tuesday, B, you can then have a real incentive to draw people in to think about how they can support your campaign. Uh, Microsoft ran a great campaign last year with Global Giving and uh, Give for Youth, which was about a, a raised over half a million dollars online very, very quickly. They had actually a quicker response than they expected, because I think what we're beginning to learn, and you'll hear this from our other panellists, is quite how many opportunities there are in quick-moving digital giving opportunities, and we'll see a lot more of that. And this is a, a smaller organisation, but an important one. Uh, this is Panthera, who are a wildlife charity, who had the most significant fundraising day in their history on Giving Tuesday by using a matching grant which they secured to message to their entire community about why Panthera mattered and, mattered and what they could do with those funds. And what was really interesting, I think this is a kind of a good symbol for all of this, was they were very smart in how they played around with their own cause and how it worked with doubling the donation. So they had nothing, nothing better on the internet than pictures of cats. Uh, as, a, as a cat charity, they have a home field advantage on this. So they flooded the internet with these kinds of pictures of two different cats, told a great story about doubling donations, and they had a really significant day, not just in terms of new uh, dollars, or should I say new pounds, um, but also in terms of new donors. So and people actually responding to this theme in some powerful ways. Uh, and then we saw some big advocates. So of course we talked about Bill Gates, but more importantly in my mind, was we saw uh, these kinds of things being uh, posted. This lady here is saying, I may not be famous, uh, I don't have a million dollars, but I can help change lives on Giving Tuesday. If you want one image for what we were trying to achieve with Giving Tuesday, I think it's this, which is to say that philanthropy isn't about being a billionaire, uh, it's an opportunity for everyone to engage, and most importantly, for everyone to feel a sense of agency about their own philanthropy. For people, for, for people to feel proud of what they do, what they stand for, and what they believe in. Uh, and then on the day itself, that was all helped by a lot of celebrity support. So one of the things we saw with Giving Tuesday um, was a lot of charities deploying their celebrities to help support them on Giving Tuesday. So we kept, this is a board that we had in the office on Giving Tuesday last year 
of people who throughout the day via social media got behind one charity or another to support Giving Tuesday. And, and you can see from this board, uh, everyone from Barbara Streisand to Ellen DeGeneres to Chelsea Clinton to Sarah Brown to Kevin Bacon and beyond, we saw a lot of celebrity engagement around Giving Tuesday. And I think that's quite a big uh, opportunity as you think about Giving Tuesday with your own organizations this year. So uh, what we've learned, I think, more than anything about Giving Tuesday, three lessons. Uh, the first is this, which is about uh, what we think of as Giving Tuesday is about, is about upload, not download. Uh, it's never been about Giving Tuesday as a kind of organizing principle, telling people what they should do. It's been about saying to people like this room, Giving Tuesday is not a complicated idea. What are your ideas to grow this movement? So we've held events all over the world now where we've simply got groups of leaders like today together and said, what do you think? What are your ideas? All of the best ideas of Giving Tuesday have come from the community and helped grow in the movement. The second thing we've learned about is the power of the posse. Um, so here is a picture of uh, me at the beginning of Giving Tuesday two years ago, uh, both to show that this is where we began at Facebook and to prove how badly I've aged over the last two years. Um, but this is, uh, this is uh, uh, friends from Facebook, from Stanford University, from the UN Foundation, and from the 92nd Street Y. And one thing I think is important about Giving Tuesday is it's not uh, about one organization and one set of values. What it's about is growing teams of amazing people to help grow Giving Tuesday. Uh, this has been replicated here in, in the UK already, that some of the leadership around Giving Tuesday UK from great organizations coming together to think about how this is going to work locally in some powerful ways. And then I think most of all, and we'll hear a better example than this, but one of the things that we learned from Giving Tuesday was through the idea of the unselfie. So you know about the selfie. Uh, last year we saw the unselfie uh, launch, which was people actually sharing images of what they care about and what they stand for. Uh, the next speaker will give you a much better example of how far that kind of trend can go. But as we think about kind of hot tips for Giving Tuesday, I think there is massive opportunity and value in getting people telling stories on their terms about their giving about your cause. So one of the big opportunities I think we'll see for this year is a much deeper sense of personalized giving. So uh, Giving Tuesday is, is an experiment. It's 20 months old. We have learned huge amounts and we couldn't be more excited to be here in the UK today uh, to think about Giving Tuesday UK. I encourage all of you to, to think about Giving Tuesday as an opportunity to experiment. Um, to try out new ideas, to try new things, but most importantly as an opportunity to join together with organizations all around the world uh, this year who will be coming together to say that no matter what may divide us, uh, one thing that unites everybody, no matter where we are or what we do, is our capacity to pause and think for a moment about others uh, and how we can support others and how we can do that as a community. Uh, that was the spirit which began Giving Tuesday. It's stronger today than ever, uh, and I couldn't be more excited about the formal launch of Giving Tuesday UK. So thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Aaron Eccles. I'm with Cancer Research UK. And I'm here to kind of talk to you a little, little bit about the No Makeup Selfie um, and how it accidentally raised us £8 million. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, I think this has a lot of learnings that we can take for um, Giving Tuesday, but I thought I'd first kind of take you through how, uh, ev what, well, just what happened and how it kind of started for us. Um, we were, uh, we have an out-of-hours team for social media. We, we cover um, late into the evening and on weekends because we see a lot of our communities uh, talk to us at that point. They post about things at that point, and we feel like it was a, it's a good investment for us to have an out-of-hours team that, that keeps an eye on things. Uh, so late one evening, we started seeing um, people posting selfies, saying they were doing it, uh, well, calling them just no makeup selfies, and they started saying they were doing it for cancer awareness, to raise awareness about cancer. We get, we had a few people start to ask us, um, "Is this your campaign? Did, did you start this?" Of course, we hadn't, so we decided, well, let's be honest about that. We tweeted this, and, um, as you can see, many are asking. We didn't start it, but we love the sentiment, and if you want to help, you can uh, go to our website. But um, I went to bed, and then the next morning got up, realized that had been retweeted hundreds of times already, and uh, we went into the office, found that traffic to the website was through the roof, um, and we, saw, we kind of did a bit of investigation and saw that this, uh, this Facebook page had popped up, which was, um, there was a few, but this one seemed to have the biggest traction, had over 200,000 likes overnight, um, no makeup selfie for cancer awareness. So a lot of people posting them, uh, saying they were doing it to, to raise awareness about cancer, but... What then happened was we started seeing a lot of people asking questions on Facebook, on Twitter, and they were asking mainly this question, um, how's the selfie going to help cure cancer? And they were accusing people of uh, being vain, of just saying, well, they were doing it for a good cause, but really they just wanted to post a selfie. And 
we saw this need that popped up that people started saying, well, we want we want this to mean something more. We want to we want our selfies to actually do do good. So um, at that point, we ran around the office and asked as many people as we could, if, you know, who would take off their makeup and pose for a selfie. Took about half an hour to find somebody, um, <laughs> but luckily, Dr. Kat Arney, one of our science communicators and spokespeople, she uh, she was happy to do it. So what we we wanted to kind of give people something an e easy way to get involved, um, but we wanted it to feel as close to the campaign, of course, that we didn't start as as it could. So had her pose with a little sign, just uh, simply said, we love your no makeup selfie. But at this point, we, we made the call to um, put a text to donate code on. We hadn't had a huge amount of success with text to donate and uh, social campaigns up to this point, but we thought, you know, this is a mobile campaign. It feels right to use text as opposed to driving them to our website. Um, at the bottom, we put a little bit of uh, T's and C's on our website, which our legal team then yelled at us for because it needs to be a lot more than that. But anyway, um, <laughs> this really did take off. Uh, within minutes, this has been shared on Facebook hundreds of times. We posted on Instagram and on Twitter as well, and it just it just spread. Um, it, and by the end of the you know this this post lifespan, it had over five million organic reach, which for us is incredible. And a, a, a kind of an average post for us uh, will have a couple hundred thousand if we're lucky. So huge. Um, what happened then was we started seeing people posting their selfies. The selfie trend continued. And instead of just um, posting the selfie, they started pr posting this proof of, of donation alongside it. So they'd, they'd get a reply text once they texted to donate. They'd screenshot that. Then they'd use you know, something like pick stitch to put them next to each other. Then they'd post that as their selfie. Uh, it was a bit of a tricky thing for us, considering the text number we gave out was different than the text reply code you get. So that caused a few problems. But we ended up having two text codes that worked. But anyway, it was still good to see that People wa really wanted to prove that they were doing good, so they were posting these alongside of it. Um, overnight, we realized this had already raised a million pounds, which was just, we couldn't believe it. We, we kind of were running around the office just trying to figure out what we were doing. We dropped everything, met meetings canceled, trying to just, you know, sitting on community management, trying to talk to as many people about it as we could. Um, at this point, we decided, you know, for the next day, 24 hours after it really got going, that we didn't want to keep asking people for, for um, donations. We didn't want to feel like we were hijacking this, this trend that had taken off. We'd already put out the text code. People were sharing it for us. So we just wanted to thank them at this point. We just you know simply say, thank you so much for doing this. But because our um, usual Facebook audience was a little bit older, uh, maybe a bit different demographic than a lot of the people who were posting selfies, we decided to put a bit of spend behind this post so we could reach as many people as we could with a thank you. So this did really well as well, 12 million reach. Um, was pretty good. <laughs> uh, we tweeted it as well, and it was our most retweeted tweet ever, just the thank you message. And um, by that point as well, we started seeing a lot of famous faces posting the selfies as well. We didn't ask any of them to do it. A lot of them just were doing it um, off their own backs. It started happening mostly in the UK, but then we started seeing US celebrities doing it as well. And that really helped drive um, the reach of it. We started getting calls from the press as well, and we were just uh, doing kind of interview after interview kept explaining, this isn't our campaign, this isn't our campaign, but they just wanted to hear about why it was raising money. Um, what was really different as well for us is this is the first time, you know, usually you struggle to get them to put your website on if you're doing a press interview. People were posting that original photo. The, the Mail Online had a picture of our Cat Arnie with the text code up. So it was all over the place. That text code just kept showing up in different places, and more and more people kept texting. And within six days, we hit this point where we realized we'd, we'd made eight million pounds, um, which was just incredible. We couldn't believe the generosity. What was interesting at this point as well was that because this had started so quickly and just kind of peaked, we had a lot of people saying, wait a minute, what's this money going to go towards? We've all done this. We've all texted and, and donated three pounds, but what are you going to spend it on? Prove, prove to us that it's going to go somewhere good. So, you know, Finding out where the money usually goes on research projects takes a very long time. It usually is a, lot, a long process involved. But we were lucky that um, we had a series of clinical trials that just the week before we didn't have enough money to fund and they'd been turned down. But we were able to say at this point, look, we've got this, these 10 trials can now be funded and they cover a range of different cancer types. And uh, <coughs> at that point, this post spiked again. We had a huge amount of reach on it. Um, we could see that the engagement rate was 15%. For us, that's huge. And that's because so many people were clicking to find out more about what type of cancer trials we were funding. So. Just a bit of analysis on that. So we've looked into it a little bit, and we see nearly 182,000 public mentions of the hashtag on, on Twitter, uh, Instagram, those sort of places, public mentions. 
Um, we found that about a quarter of those also mentioned Cancer Research UK in some shape or form. So our Twitter handle or Cancer Research UK is in the tweet, which was fantastic for a campaign we didn't start. But what we also saw was just the speed that this took off and, and then went away. So you see this, this is the kind of the hashtag's lifetime. Uh, absolute spike at the start, and then another little spike when we had the, the announcement of 8 million. But what you can see in the next slide is that the blue um, line shows the total number of texts, and the other two lines are, are um, uh, kind of other things that people did. They came to our website, traffic to our website, to sign up for things like Race for Life or to, um, uh, or to kind of donate directly on our website. It was interesting for us that those peaked a day earlier, <coughs> excuse me, um, because we think that we saw the, ex the extent of the, the sharing and the viral reach of it that spiked the second time, allowing um, the text code to kind of, uh, the book that showed us that the text code just made it so much further and had that, that kind of PR element to it. Uh, other impact, over 200,000, 220,000 new fans on Facebook, 18,000 new Twitter followers for us, which was fantastic. But the big success story was also Instagram. We hadn't been using it necessarily properly yet. We'd been posting things to Instagram, but we saw 130,000 public mentions of No Makeup Selfie on Instagram. And that's for, for kind of a channel that we have only started using. We realized this is absolutely something we need to do more of. Um, we did a bit of analysis on our audience as well. Uh, as you can probably expect, nearly 90% female, but um, <coughs> very, very young as well. So very, very young audience compared to what we're used to. And I think this is where it comes into what we can learn for Giving Tuesday. But the hashtag was used all over the world. It started really big in the UK, but spread quickly around the globe. <coughs> and uh, we were getting calls from charities in New Zealand, in Australia, um, just to see what they could, how they could get involved as well. Um, indeed, 34% uh, of tweets about using No Makeup Selfie came from outside the UK. So there's a lot of people there asking how they could support um, our work, how they, how they could get involved because they weren't able to text to donate. So we were kind of thinking for another campaign like this, and I think Giving Tuesday is a good example of how um, a campaign can have that global reach and people can get involved in different ways. So we were able to just tell people, go to our website and donate if you'd like to. But we saw no, a lot of other cancer charities around the globe also picking up on, on No Makeup Selfie and making a lot of money out of it as well. So just um, a couple of key learnings on this. I think for us, for when we'd look for um, how to kind of, well, we're going to struggle to replicate something like this, but I think what we'd want to learn from this is that um, we need to be able to tap into these trends whenever they're happening. So out of hours cover is essential. Uh, we know that the content needed to be really simple and really live alongside what people were trying to do with the campaign. Um, I think the text code, the mobile nature of this campaign was really, really important. So the fact that people um, could just take out their phone, they could do the selfie, they could they could screenshot the text code, they could text to donate, all happen on mobile. And uh, for us as well, I think just showing that Instagram is something that we need to keep an eye on. And you know, I think we saw it with um, the Giving Tuesday stuff as well, that people are using it and a lot of people are posting to it. So it's a channel we shouldn't be ignoring. But so that's it for me. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Dominic, I'm from the, the Giving Lab, and um, I also have a day job in um, Seren, which is a commercial company, but we fundamentally do the same thing. So I always laugh and say I go to, week, um, to, go to work for half of the week and get paid really well, and the other half of the week I do um, for considerably less. Um, but what we do is the same principle. We design experiences, um, particularly in digital, but also in other spaces that are based on huge amounts of customer research and trying to understand what people do. So we have a mantra about that we believe in be customers' behaviours, and we look very deeply for, for behaviours and evidence of behaviours rather than opinions. So a big, big difference, I think, to, to some traditional um, design agencies. And then what we try and do is design those services based around those needs, and then most importantly, we measure whether they're effective or whether they can be improved. And we try to bring both of those disciplines into the charity sector and take the learnings from the charity sector out to, to other commercial companies, because we think there's a, a lot to be learned, particularly in the digital space where it's changing very rapidly. So what I wanted to, to talk about today is to think really about experience, and I think Giving Tuesday, is, and we've seen some amazing examples, is a really big opportunity to do some completely new stuff, to try something completely different and see whether it works. And I just wanted to give you some very quick insights um, from where we've started and how we started to talk about some of those problems and what might be helpful to you. And I wanted to really think about how 
experiences and how we think about them has changed so much. So if you think back to the 1950s, for those of you old enough to remember it, or those of you who can imagine what that might be like, um, in my previous life as, as a TV producer, uh, that's what channel hopping looked like back in the 1950s. It was either A or B, which do you, which do you want to do? And of course, the world that we live in now, we demand and expect a huge amount of choice. So um, this doesn't do full justice to the 500 TV channels most people can access if you have a Sky, Sky subscription, if you're online and you can access a billion videos on YouTube, um, if you're a subscriber to Netflix, you can call up content on demand to suit whatever platform you want to view it on, wherever you are, um, so long as there's an internet connection. You know, we expect huge amounts of choice in our, in our experiences. Um, if you think about our access to information and how we find stuff, this is what I imagine the World Wide Web in the 1950s looked like. Um, it certainly was when I was growing up as a child. Um, it was a pretty scary place to go. It was quite um, controlled. There's very limited amounts of information. So Encyclopedia Britannica was a, was a big thing for me as a child. Um, and it was out of date, most of it. So it was very hard to, to find stuff. And then, of course, um, the world changes and Google comes along and has the aspiration to index every piece of knowledge in the world and to make that available at your fingertips. That experience is extraordinary. I think we take that for granted every day and we take Wikipedia for granted as a, an amazing reference service. We take YouTube and the access that we have both to view but also to upload and create video and share that around the world utterly for granted. I think our notions of experience and what we expect and demand from the experiences we have from charities and other organisations has changed out of all recognition in 10 years. Um, and then if you think what 1950s luxury might have looked like. This is a luxury motor car, an Austin 7, top of the range, only available to a very select few in the sort of post-austerity Britain. Um, and then I, I gave a great talk with a chap from Land Rover. Um, he told me the story of the Evoque, you know, amazing luxury um, product. Um, that's the definition for them of the cutting edge of luxury promoted and launched by Victoria Beckham, as you, as you may well know, and saved Land Rover's fortune. So by being imaginative, and thinking of a completely new experience, they created a brand new category in the car sector. They recruited a whole bunch of people as customers um, who were prepared to give their money for cars that they would never have traditionally buy. And you may or may not know, but at the time they were paying um, Victoria Beckham a large amount of money to come and endorse the car and to launch it, they were also going bankrupt very rapidly and hadn't actually paid the wages to the staff at their plants. So it was two weeks. So being imaginative, changing the experience was a really big brave thing for Jaguar to do. They bet the entire firm on that particular car and they came up trumps and they saved it and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, they also had a very stubborn, persistent designer. All the engineers said, you can't build this car, nobody will buy it, it's not traditional. And this designer said, I'm not changing a single thing. This is the thing I want to create. I believe in this, I have the same passion. So I think the same passion you've seen in some of the ideas and the experiences they wanted to create, where they're authentic, where they're created by social connection, and by real sense of purpose, I think is very important, and I think he had that for, for Land Rover. So then I was starting to think um, last night about sort of fundraising in the 1950s and, and 60s, what might be the ingredients of that. So lots of street fundraising, street collections, sort of boxes and buckets all over the place. Some pretty emotive, heart-wrenching um, campaign material. So this is from Oxfam, I believe, in the 1960s. Um, and then, of course, celebrity endorsement. I hadn't realised that Elvis Presley had endorsed cancer and cancer checks back in the 19. Um, 60s, oh sorry, 1950s. Um, so really interesting, so some familiar ingredients there. So then I was thinking, well, what does fundraising in the 21st century look like? Well, we've still got some of those pretty eye-catching, grabby, emotional, um, um, heart-wrenching appeals. There's a lot of buckets all over the place and various collecting things. And guess what? There's a few celebrities, and the celebrity definition seems to have been stretched um, since the old days, um, <laughs> about what that might mean. But I think there's a real opportunity, and in all seriousness, I think the range of experiences in giving is very limited compared to the sheer diversity and imagination and amazingness that sits in the charity sector. And I think Giving Tuesday gives you an extraordinary moment and also license to both experiment with your own ideas, to draw a crowd of people and say, how do we collaborate to create new experiences and to just try some new stuff and try different channels and try different things and not be afraid if it doesn't work or you have to learn on the hoof or you have to react very quickly as we've we've just heard. I think doing more of this same stuff would be really sad if that was our response to the giving experience in the 21st century, that we think that's where we should start. And the reason why I think that so passionately, and I feel I'm prepared to state that so boldly, is because the research that we've been doing over the last five, six years, and by the way, there's loads of it on the blog for free, we publish all of our research, um, that you can actually find, is we think there's a massive generational shift. People's expectations, as we've talked about, have changed from my parents and my grandparents 
desires, needs, wants and, and channels of communicating with charities have changed out of all recognition and people coming in the generation below me also have very different needs and wants and I think we need to offer a range of different experiences. So we firmly believe giving should be a great experience and we mean experience in a very holistic sense. It's not a transaction and particularly if you're thinking about giving money and time and other kind of endorsement or support or resources. So we'd like to, to encourage you to think about it experientially. Um, and we've got sort of five quick points which might be helpful. So to give you, again, you get all the detail on the blog site, but we looked at street fundraising. We did an interesting campaign with the Children's Society up in Newcastle, and they started wanting to make giving transparent to tell people about what they did with runaways and other kids at risk in Newcastle. We did lots of tests with different groups up there. The more we told them about the problems and the complexity and the nature of kids at risk of sexual exploitation and runaways in Newcastle, the less people wanted to give. It wasn't a story that they wanted to hear because it was too complex, it was too nuanced. They wanted lots of very vulnerable looking seven-year-olds who they could then save through their donation. And unfortunately, the complexity of the Children's Society's excellent work up there, actually, the more we told them, the more difficult it was to get your head around it. So we said, well, okay, how do we, how do we change the terms of engagement around that? So we said, well, okay, if you don't want to engage with the notion of kids disappearing, can we make other things disappear? So we engaged um, as street fundraisers, became magicians, and so we use magicians to engage and start telling that story, and we weave the data collection into that process. So you had to text to make things vanish, or text to make things appear, and that delivered three times the usual data collection rate. So I think engagement is the first place to start. Think about how you're engaging, and you've seen amazing examples of, of different way people have engaged. The second, slightly more frivolous one some people might consider, um, is thinking about how you use a channel in a very different way and think very deeply about audience need. So Comic Relief wanted to attract young men, traditionally a very tough category to engage in fundraising for them, and therefore they wanted to think about what were their desires and needs. So we tested, dead, dead cheap. How do you test different concepts in front of Facebook audiences against the target groups you're trying to reach? So we tested the traditional, would you like to help raise money for Comic Relief, for supporting work in, in Africa and here? Um, that got a pretty modest response, it has to be said, from, from young men on Facebook. We then said, would you like to get the Britain's biggest fart? That then did five, six times the response rate. So we knew if you wanted to get engagement from that audience, we had to start in a different way. We then created, through a, a process which is detailed on the blog, Britain's biggest fart app. Um, a slightly frivolous way, as I say, people might say, to, to engage people in charity. But the great news is we got 100,000 downloads on it. Um, it was a game that you could play by sending farts to your friends via SMS activation, so your donation was via SMS. Amazingly, 46% of people actually texted themselves because they wanted their phone to fart for themselves. Um, and we found this extraordinary phenomenon where the top farters in Britain weren't men as we expected, but the top three were women. They turned out to be far more competitive on the farting front than, than men did. But the, the serious point behind that, and there is a lot about the gamification of that process and how you engage people in a social way and get them to be competitive whilst doing good, I think is, is very useful in this context. But 46% of those people were first-time fundraisers, 60% were under 30, and 53% were men. So it absolutely hit its target audience, bang on. And it's a, it's a tricky process, but it was about understanding <coughs> audience needs, the channels they used, what they found engaging, and then how do you start from there and build in the fundraising. You might have seen the art fund, we helped advise on this a while back, did an amazing thing last year, and I think they're repeating it this year to create a national gallery of art at every bus stop up and down the country. So thousands and thousands of pieces of art, a really amazing campaign. And the great thing is if you sponsored a bus stop and it was a physical paper one, they would send you the piece of art after the process. You have a living experience. So you see the thing go up, hopefully in your area, they're in every district across the country, and then you can actually take that away. So I now have this ginormous poster of a piece of art which doesn't fit on any wall in my house anywhere. But it caused me to give five times what I would give as an average donation because I thought the cause was motivating, but I really like the treats, and we're going to come back to treats. So um, a fourth one, just to keep you thinking, this is a crappy old um, disused toilet up in Hackney. Um, there are a few of those in Hackney, um, but people there in the community wanted to make something very different happen. It wasn't through a traditional charity mechanism. It was a bunch of people in a local community said, I want to make a difference. They set about going, can we create a place that creates a social centre? And they wanted to create a cafe that was run by Nanas. Um, it's another project that I've sponsored. Um, I was very proud to have sponsored this. And the fantastic thing is I can go any day of the week and meet the Nanas that I've managed out in the beautiful place that they've created 
in a, and it's also got the most beautiful toilet, by the way. So the building is split in half and has been restored with a 1950s toilet with all the perfect fittings and fixtures from that. So if you want a retro toilet experience, you're going through one door. And if you'd like a Nana's cafe at the heart of a community, and the Nana's serve alcohol, by the way, they're a pretty, pretty racy bunch of Nana's. Um, they're there to support and be heart of, at the heart of their community. A really interesting project funded on Kickstarter, raised 15,000 pounds and really brought together a community in that place. Which then brings me to my final point. If you then think about what Kickstarter's done, they brought in new people, they brought in new ideas, they brought new ways of funding to the market. And I think it's really important is how do charities bring in new ideas, new people, listen to different people in the organisations and experiment. Um, that's how it's become a $1 billion business, an extraordinary, extraordinary achievement. And I think for me there are two key ingredients. There are new ideas, it's a wider portfolio of things, they offer treats to some degree on every donation you make, so it becomes an amazing experience. It gives you deep connection with that. And for that reason, I think it's brought a whole bunch of new givers or encouraged people to give more um, to the sector. So again, a really important addition to the landscape. So finally, I just think you've got this amazing opportunity. It's just like, go bonkers and do something really mad. And if you, if you can do it, really sort of push it in different ways. So I think about givers as customers and think about their needs and what they find exciting and interesting. I'd understand and try and create experiences that connect their needs to your um, passions. And I think we've seen some great examples of that. Bring new people, new influences into the organisation to do that. And then the final bit, I, can't, I talk a lot about failure in a lot of... Um, reports. By the way, Nick Hebb was, was horrified to find that government funding might have gone into a fart app, and I said, but it's a key part of a learning experience. Um, and I think the fourth point is very important. It is okay to fail. If you're trying new stuff and you want to reach a new audience, it's an essential part of innovation, and that organisations should feel comfortable with that. I think the key bit is it's test, fail, and learn. And if you've learned, it's been a worthwhile experience, which then means it becomes test, succeed, and learn when you do it the second time or third or fourth time round. So I think I'm, I'm a great admirer of cancer research because I think they conduct a portfolio approach. They take lots of things to market, many of which don't work. They maybe don't talk so much about those. But the reason why they have great success is not because they're singular geniuses at picking the one brilliant idea. It's because they take a portfolio of things to market and they're brilliant at scaling the ones that really work. So I would say experiment take two or three ideas, use this opportunity, and you know, go and delight both yourselves and the people and the communities you work with. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I'm Gareth, I'm from Prostate Cancer UK. Uh, I've got a very low-tech presentation, it's all on here. Uh, so that's the only slide that you'll see from me. Um, a couple of points about the no makeup selfie, actually. Um, uh, a lot of people are asking us how we could get involved with No Makeup Selfie. You know, Prostate Cancer UK is a predominantly male charity, um, being that prostate cancer only affects men. Uh, so people are wondering how to get involved in that. And again, it didn't come from us. It came from supporters and uh, our audience. We had a few suggestions. One was a sock with, on a place where it rhymes with. And the other, um, the other one, which uh, actually ended up raising a little bit of money for us, was the Makeup Selfie. So a few men just got us of makeup on, took pictures of themselves, and uh, we put a text code to that. And, we raised about 10 grand, so it's not quite the same scale, but similar sort of thing. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, an experiment that we did um, in January 2013. Um, we, in January 2013, we launched our first major TV advertising campaign above the line uh, all through, and in November of 2012, we were kind of wondering how we get involved with this digitally, how we engage our supporters, how we get people... We wanted our own supporters to feel as involved in it as, as we did, as not just the general public, but actually to make people feel they could be a part of it. Uh, so this was, uh, this was about a month after I'd got my roles, had digital there. So I thought, hey, let's do a massive experiment. It's the first thing you do in the job, right? Um, and we were thinking quite a lot about um, how online giving is actually really impersonal. Um, you give uh, some money to a bucket shaker or, um, or any, you sponsor somebody, um, then you get at least a smile or a thank you, uh, maybe a shake of the hand or something like that, or a stick or something like that. And it's, it's actually quite a quick transaction for a fiver, and it's quite quite a nice thing. But um, when you donate online, first of all, you have to give all your um, name and address details, your bank details, everything. You have to put that all in. At the end of it, you get a receipt. Um, so we were, trying, we were thinking about how that doesn't really chime, that the digital experience isn't really that much fun. Um, and so we were thinking about how we could, how we could use those thoughts and this big campaign, which was based around 
um, a sledgehammer. Um, so uh, there was an advert with Bill Bailey talking about nutcracker being the size, the prostate being the size of a walnut. Um, but it's, there's lots of things go wrong with it, and the overall problem with prostate cancer is very difficult nut to crack, so big that we're going to need a very big sledgehammer indeed. So the whole thing was about cracking um, prostate cancer um, through donations. Um, so I thought, how can we do this? Um, and we came to the idea of a nutcracker suite. So the idea was that for two weeks uh, we would live stream um, a room and people would, um, a combination of volunteers, uh, VIP supporters, men with prostate cancer, fundraisers, uh, they would all uh, take it in turns and any time a donation was made to them on their behalf or to us, um, a little uh, message would flash up in this room that's being streamed live on the net uh, that donation we made, and they would smash a walnut, physically smash a walnut. So we had a little anvil, we had 30,000 walnuts, uh, we had a selection of sledgehammers, uh, we had goggles and uh, hard um, steel toe cap boots and hard hats, uh, and a lot of smashing walnuts. So 10,000 many a year die of prostate cancer, so we thought it would be good to get 10,000 walnuts smashed in the two-week period. Um, it was, uh, yeah, we, so we decided on that just before Christmas, which gave me a great Christmas of trying to find a space to put this all on. We managed to find a, um, an, an empty lot in uh, Holborn, so it was central London. It had a shop front, so we kissed it out um, to make it into a, a set, basically. So we got that for free. We got our donut, our donuts, our walnuts uh, donated by Marks and Spencer, one of our corporate partners. We got uh, the, the sledgehammers and our, our hard hats and all our boiler suits stuff donated by Keyline, another one of our corporate supporters. Um, and we didn't know what we were doing. Um, we uh, we just went for it, and um, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, we learned a lot from it. Um, first of all, make sure if you're going to do some live streaming from anywhere, make sure you got some like just some broadband is really useful. Um, <laughs> little things like that that when you're rushing around trying to find um, trying to find a room that you can actually do this for in central London, that you don't think about the actual things like running water and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, there were lots of different people going in there, um, smashing uh, walnuts, being broadcast live uh, on our website, and every time someone donated, they got a massive thank you. Um, and they used the people in there used social media to use talk to their own networks, and they said it was much like a sponsorship opportunity. But instead of having to someone having to schlep down to um, Horse Guards Parade to cheer them on at the marathon, they could actually do it from their own uh, from their own house, from their room, from work, or wherever, wherever they wanted to. Um, and so they, they found it a lot easier to get sponsorship in a lot of ways, these, these people who were involved. Um, they also, because they were there, people could see they were there, and so we started getting some funny requests for sponsorship, so um, uh, for donations. Uh, it's almost like um, forfeits, so people would have to sing a song if they got a certain amount of money. There's a little totalizer going up the whole time, so going, right, if, if it gets to Two hundred pounds. Then uh, I'll sing. Um, who was, there was a there was a late Orient fan, and he had to sing uh, a song by another football club, um, and that was that was a big thing for him. And worked for his social networks as well. Um, and so that that worked quite well in expanding it beyond there. And I don't think it really worked in terms of socially uh, getting it beyond those networks. So that's one of the things that we didn't do particularly well with it. Partly because we couldn't actually describe the whole thing to people before the event because we didn't know how it was going to be, um, is we didn't do a lot of our own amplification on it. So we, we talked about it quite a bit, but we hadn't worked with our media team to um, get that working through, or the VIPs who came down and just turned up. They, weren't, they hadn't set themselves up, and they said afterwards, oh, if we'd known about exactly what this was going to be, then we could have gotten our friends involved, we would have uh, had a lot more um, donations. And they, they made, it was quite competitive, because uh, you had a little totaliser for each person. So, um, yeah, I think... That was that was really interesting for us in terms of social. It wasn't um, it wasn't the huge reach that we, you get with a no makeup selfie or, or like a lot of big social media campaigns. But it was very localized, and it, it definitely helped those people involved, those people getting the money, basically bringing the money in on camera. It helped them uh, to, to widen it out a bit further, um, and that was. That, that was that was pretty big for us. Um, so it did it did bring in enough money to make it a credible experiment. Um, but there are lots of things which we couldn't work out because basically we didn't have the infrastructure. So att our attribution was all over the place. We didn't know our whole donation journey was just a bit horrible at the time. Um, we didn't quite have uh, the right things to uh, 
make sure we had good follow-up or be able to say, oh, you donated to so-and-so, uh, then this was a good thing and you can have a video of it later on. We just didn't have that set up. But um, overall, it was, it was a very positive experience. And I think um, that, that what you're saying before about it being okay to fail, I think that was, that was mainly okay for us because it wasn't a fundraising campaign. If it had been paid for by the fundraising team, then I would have lost my job, I think. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but, it, but we saw it as, as a comms thing. Um, and that's, I think, it is okay to fail, but you have to work, has, have to agree whose money you're going to fail with, I think, sometimes. And I think fundraising budgets are often a lot more strict on uh, the experimentation you, you can do with that because you have to bring back a certain amount of investment. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's pretty much what I have to say. <laughs> uh, I don't have a thank you slide at the end. Um, but uh, it's really great to Giving Tuesday coming to, uh, to UK, um, and I hope lots more experimental things will happen. Um, but, yeah, make sure you get the right uh, things in place to make sure you can make the most of the experiment. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gareth. Um, and thank you, um, our other speakers, Henry, Aaron, um, Dominic, as well. Um, what an uh, amazing, um, concise collection of experience, success, and a whole lot of frank failures as well. So I hope you take um, some, I certainly take quite a lot of um, satisfaction from knowing that these people that have made some great achievements have also done it the hard way, failing again and again, and then learning what actually works. So, and I'm aware that this week is also Small Charities Week, um, and we've heard from some of the bigger charities, but equally, They've all taken a very sort of do-it-yourself, learn-as-you-go approach based on good fundraising communications experience. So I hope smaller charities take um, that as inspiration as well. And I know smaller charities are also at the heart of the Giving Tuesday UK campaign. You've also very quietly um, and politely, um, while we've heard from all this um, collection of expertise. So I'm now going to open it up to the people in the room um, to ask some questions of our, of our speakers or to share your own comments or experiences um, based on, on these themes. You're, right, you're welcome to talk about what you've heard here or even ask about more about Giving Tuesday and how you can take part. So who's up first for some questions? Yes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat them back so our friends who are watching online can also definitely hear it and then I'll choose speakers. You know, that's funny, that crossed my mind when there was one mayor mentioned, there tends yeah. to be one that comes to mind. The question was, is uh, Giving Tuesday UK planning to petition one particular mayor in the UK? So I'll pass that to uh, Henry to uh, let us know. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as we speak, I think Giving Tuesday UK has some tweet tweeters in the room. Um, if Giving Tuesday UK could tweet Boris Johnson now and say... Boris, will you be the first mayor in the UK? Bear, will you be the first mayor in the UK to support Giving Tuesday? And then retweet that. We might be off to a good start. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other instant requests people want via Twitter? Any any more questions on what, what you've heard today? Yes. Actually, Gareth, do you want to stand up? So Gareth was asked, um, with all the learning, um, what's he going to do differently um, with the next campaign? I, I don't think we'd do the Nutcracker Suite exactly again. It was, it was tied specifically to an advert uh, that we had, which was about smashing walnuts. Um, although walnuts are still an important uh, motif for, for Prostate Cancer UK, I would say. Um, I think next year, when we've got our house in order a bit more, then we'll start to look at doing something like that. And it's the kind of thing that... We could see working, we have, we have a football league partnership, um, so football's very big for us, and one of the things that we're constantly trying to work on is how do we activate football fans um, at, a, at a football match? Um, there's 20,000 people there, can we get them to do something beyond just maybe sticking a quid in a bucket? Um, and that's the kind of thing that if we could partner with a media company, then we could roadshow something like that, where people get involved, um, and I think that would be really powerful, yeah. There's, I think it's, there's a lot of scope to do something, but I think we need to get everything else. We're almost two years ahead of ourselves, I think. So, yeah, I think so. 
Thank you. And, oh, yes, lots of questions. All right, yes. Uh, with Giving Tuesday, did you see a lot of build up um, before the date and then kind of the, how long after did it echo? The question was for Henry. Um, was there a lot of build up before Giving Tuesday and how long afterwards did it, did it echo and cascade? Yeah, so one of the things, one of the things our partners at the UN Foundation who put together all the communications toolkits, we had a really, it was a really interesting experiment for us, which was there was a, a shared set of messages, tweets, social media, press releases, which all partners could use or not use as they saw fit, which meant there was kind of a shared editorial story leading up to Giving Tuesday. So particularly in like the three or four days beforehand, as you're really building up a lot of buzz, we saw a lot of, um, a lot of ramp up as we got into Giving Tuesday itself. But then what was also really interesting was people using Giving Tuesday not just as a day in, uh, in itself, but as an inflection point. So things I think are really big opportunities uh, particularly in this country, payroll giving, right, as something which you can get people to agree to on Giving Tuesday and then obviously sign up on Giving Tuesday is big. Employee giving did very well on Giving Tuesday, so company people who are going in saying, can you get your employees to give and engage, I think it's a really powerful idea. And you saw a lot of creativity from people like the Case Foundation who declared every Tuesday in December as Giving Tuesday. So they said, well, I'll give in Tuesday, we're going to have five of them, so we'll do them for, or four of them. We'll do them four Tuesdays in a row and then turn that into their organisation. And again, it's really interesting to hear the other panellists talk today. The, the kind of the, the line running through all of these experiences is um, the, the old ways uh, aren't going to work in the ways we need them to. Uh, the new ways aren't crystal clear as to what they are quite yet. So we need to be in that middle space between the two, which is just trying to learn these new behaviours and new skills. So I think what's exciting about Giving Tuesday and the you know, the first uh, suggestion about Boris Johnson is a good example. Is it just it gives us a chance to try and license to try new things, and, and we've we've embraced that uh, ourselves in terms of how we think about Giving Tuesday and given ourselves the chance to say we'll try stuff, even if it works great, and if it doesn't work, that's okay. But I think this idea about learning from failure is so important because everyone's talking about failure as being cool, and failure is only cool if you learn from it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just failure. Thank you. Uh, yes, William. Uh, yeah, so William McCann from the National Funding Scheme. Uh, uh, it's a question uh, for Giving Tuesday in New York to Henry. So Henry, you talked a lot about what worked really well. I'm quite interested to hear what was really hard and what you cracked, uh, which you didn't expect to have to crack and how you went about it. A very good question from William of the National Funding Scheme. Again for Henry, what was hard? Um, so the, it was, it was, I think we didn't do enough thinking. I think that's probably the biggest challenge with all of this now is that the, you know, again, all the examples we've just, we've just heard of, they're all pretty experimental. Let's try this stuff. Let's see what goes on. And actually the presentation, um, the most thoughtful of, of our four presentations was one thinking about how donor behavior is changing and what it means. We've only started to think about it in a, that in a deep way recently because we were a bit too busy doing, right? We're just, we're going to try this stuff. We're going to see what's work. Um, and I think one challenge for us as a community and as a sector is the balance between the kind of deeper thinking and learning about how the world is changing and not letting that be an excuse for us not to get on with things. And I think that's been the biggest challenge for Giving Tuesday. And it's interesting because I was hearing from Howard earlier, where he was saying he's, you know, he literally wrote the book on digital fundraising. And he was saying, I now can't fully keep up with all the changing trends that are happening. If he can't keep up, what hope for the rest of us? So the, the question, therefore, is given we can't now know everything, um, what can we learn to do? And I think that's been the ongoing challenge of Giving Tuesday. And also the tension as a movement between the middle and the periphery, right? So um, w none of us are used to this idea of giving up control. You saw that with the no makeup selfie, this idea, right? That it was, it was created by the crowd and then you found the way to fit yourself into the narrative. That is the opposite of what usually happens. Right. So that's a really new skill for all of us, which is to stand back and lose our kind of let, let go of our old power instincts and embrace the kind of new power world. I think that's the biggest challenge for Giving Tuesday. Actually, I think it's the biggest challenge for all of our organisations because that's where the world is going. The question is, can we keep up? Sorry, I just wanted to, to pick up because I thought it was a really, really thoughtful piece because lots of people do talk about the complexity of the world and, and we wrestle with you know, multi-dimensional, multi-territory, multi-huge problems for, for big corporates primarily and some charities of scale. But I think you also had the answer in what you just said, which is it's about collaboration. It, these ideas are too complex and the paths are too complex and they're moving too quickly for any one single person to have the genius idea. 
And I came from a, a world of media where when I ran Strictly Come Dancing or The Apprentice, it was my genius, brilliant thing. I could just impose on the rest of the world because I controlled the distribution channel, I controlled the editorial shape of it. So it's a fantastic ego boost for me when I lived in that world. But I've had to learn over the last six, seven, eight years that actually that model just doesn't work anymore. And you have to collaborate. You have to invite not only the audience into that process, number one, but you need a diversity of skills within that to deal with that complexity and put the composite of all of those brains together to solve those problems. And it's all messy. You know, it's just all messy and it's all changing. So experimentation is the heart of it. So if you're feeling confused and going, oh my God, this is a nightmare, it's because it is. And actually that's okay. But what you do have to have is a sense of purpose about what you want to do. And I think that's what you've articulated fantastically. And therefore, if you can get that, you can then draw a whole bunch of people with different skills, some of whom you employ, some of whom are volunteers, some of whom just happen to be passing and care about the same stuff. And it's how you manage all of that relationship and that what I would call an ecosystem, I think is the big challenge for all organisations, commercial or charity, in the world that we're, we're moving into. So I think, you know, don't be, don't be scared by the complexity of it. <coughs> Thank you, Dominic. I'd, I'd agree. Um, I think some of the best fundraisers that I've ever met in my uh, 25 years of fundraising um, are those that actually have copied or rather emulated others. They stand, stood on, pe on other people's shoulders just to get a little further ahead. And it makes them look really good, as if they created the idea. They'll be the f they should be the first to admit that they actually just took the best from other people, which is just a yet another reason for events like this for... Um, giving Tuesday, for watching what other charities are doing, and they're just trying to tweak it um, to your advantage to do it even better. So that's my, my take on it. Yes? Um, I wondered if um, uh, Henry had any thoughts on what sort of numbers he might, might be expecting from the UK this year um, with the launch of Giving Tuesday. So, um, what sort of potential, what sort of success it might have this year? A very good question. Henry, how big is Giving Tuesday in the UK going to be, or might be? Um, so I think I think that's up to you, really. I mean, the uh, the the uh, just in terms of this is one of the great things about being involved in movements is sometimes you can move away. Um, and I live in New York, and we we're working hard on America Given Tuesday, and we've got our hands full with that. And there's a great team here um, with CAF and Blackboard and the Cabinet Office, and actually I hope a bunch more people in this room who are going to come together and say, look, this is to this point earlier, which is. Um, None, none of us are big enough to succeed, right? There's the whole kind of too big to fail. Uh, we're not also not big enough to succeed. How do we build these groups of people to actually run campaigns like this from different organisations? I think that's what's next for Giving Tuesday UK, and I'd encourage you to speak to the CAF team and the Blackboard team and to others if you want to take a leadership role more than just your organisation doing something for Giving Tuesday. In terms of expectation setting, I think uh, I, I wouldn't put out a number right now. I think what I'd say this year is, um, if you're looking for a goal for year one, this is just my advice as a friend from abroad. My, my advice as a friend from abroad would be, if you could get this onto the public radar this year, that would be a very good start, right? Creating something which actually was a national day of giving every year would be an amazing achievement for the sector. So year one, I would be thinking about how do you get this on the radar and then give yourself another 12-month cycle after that to build for year two. Um, but as I say, this is to be decided by the people in this room. Thank you, Henry. Just another reminder that the conversations around Giving Tuesday will, UK will carry on. There is the hashtag Giving Tuesday UK, um, which you can explore on Twitter either now or after this event and carry on the conversation. There's also the givingtuesday.org.uk website, which I've just seen today for the very first time. So explore there. There's details of how you can sign up as a partner, whether, whether as a charity or as an organisation. Um, yes, there were some more questions coming. Uh, yes. Um, I'm um, Zoe from Leprosy Mission. How international is um, Giving Tuesday? So in Australia or New Zealand or Switzerland, have people heard of it? Henry, how international is Giving Tuesday? You are the star of today. You get to ask, answer all the questions. Uh, um, well, one out of three. I think Australia, New Zealand and Switzerland. Uh, it was pretty big in Australia last year. A really good group of people worked on it there. I think New Zealand a little bit. I think Switzerland not at all. Um, but there are groups now working. Canada did very well last year. Uh, Israel did very well last year. Latin America uh, really worked quite nicely. Mexico. Brazil's coming on well. Singapore had a good year. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a kind of constituency of people growing around the world. But also we have the partnership with UNDP, the United Nations Development Programme, where Giving Tuesday is coming to life in some of the most challenged countries in the world. And again, I think that's a really important idea that the community of giving... Um, you know, can stretch from the richest man on earth to some of the most challenging countries in the world. 
if it is possible to unite that community with a common bond of social media, that, that's a powerful idea. So we're beginning to think a bit more about global, and, and, and it's, it's always based on this kind of room of people, which is, can you get the right people in the room at the start, get them working together, and, and see where it goes. Yes. The question was, which is probably one of the most commonly asked questions, I suspect, of the No Makeup Selfie campaign is what happens next? How has or how does Cancer Research UK plan to stay in touch with some or all of these supporters? Is there a, is there a second stage or an ongoing relationship? So I'll ask Aaron to do that. Bring some water this time. Um, I think, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. I think. Um, one of the, the tricky bits for us was because it was a text to donate uh, mechanism, you don't get as much information about a, um, a donor or a supporter as you would through um, people signing up to fundraise for you or doing something online. But that said, um, we did get a lot of mobile numbers. And thinking about that as alongside what um, the, the hundreds of thousands of people who signed up to our um, social channels, we had to think a lot about what we do with these people now. They're a lot younger, they're a different audience. We did a bit of um, work to see if they were uh, already fans on Facebook and most of them weren't so really new audience for us and we had to think well we don't want to maybe put them through the supporter journey like we would through another um, somebody who signed up for Race for Life for instance so we have to think about what campaigns are right for them um, we want them to be part of something possibly you know something quite big something something amazing that uh, you know they were already part of something a huge a huge um, fundraising campaign that they started that they that they made their own so if we can find a way to then get them involved with another campaign like that and say, you know, you were already pioneers in this area, can you, can you come and help us again? I think that's probably what we'd want to do as opposed to um, trying to kind of convert them in other ways or, or constantly calling them and saying, do you want to sign up for um, regular uh, donations? But yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good question. We're, we're, we're still trying to figure out exactly what to do, but we know that we've tailored our content on social media a little bit differently now. Um, we want to try to keep communicating with these people in a, in a way we've, we've keep kept them up to date with the campaigns that, um, or the, sorry, the, um, uh, the clinical trials that they've helped to fund, so we're trying to keep them up to date on those and just make sure they know the money that they did give uh, is going to a really good place. Yes. Sorry. Yes. If you've got the mobile numbers, have they given you their permission? Go back to them. So does that come with? Is that part of what the T's and C's are? You know, is that automatically assigned and adopted? Yeah. So the question is, um, when they do, do we have permission to go back to them via mobile? And I think when they um, when they donate, they're given a a reply text, which gives them the option to opt out right then and there. Okay, I'm going to ask a question to whichever the panelists want to answer, answer that in, and that is, based on your experience, what can the majority of smaller charities in the UK do with digital? What should they be focusing on? And perhaps try and link that in with, with Charity Tuesday, sorry, with Giving Tuesday, and what they can do with that, that campaign. Um, stop. Dominic, do you want to... Well, Actually, do you want to come and yes. stand up? Um, yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot. Well, yes, no, it, it's, a really, it's a really interesting challenge um, about what do smaller charities um, do with digital. I think there, there's probably two or three things. Is I think first you need to get your board educated about it. And I think uh, we've seen in, in all kinds of um, different case studies that we've done, and we'll spare the blushes of some of the charities we've worked with, but they've had brilliantly innovative people in their fundraising teams or other parts of teams who've wanted to change the traditional way of doing things, and then the board has found out. Um, and it's all ground to a halt and it started to look like very traditional, quite dull stuff that they've done in the past. And then they've wondered why it doesn't work as a, as a strategy. So um, my number one would, recommendation would be get the board behind it, get them using devices, get them trying experiences, get them to tweet. And we've run speed tweet classes in the city for 
um, very traditional lawyers, we've done it with all kinds of other different groups, you know, get them to feel comfortable with the technology because everybody worries about risk. And so we did an amazing campaign with a charity that we were very inspired by where we pulled in all kinds of favours to make quite a racy video which we felt had the potential to go viral. We got some of the top art directors in the country to give their time for free. We got models to give their time for free. The charity were hugely excited about it. It was all ready to go. It had been six months work to script and recruit those people and get it ready to go. And then the board saw it. So they'd been informed all the way through that process and went, bloody hell, that's not what we thought we were going to do. Um, and when we said the title was the Naked Soldier campaign, what exactly did you expect it to involve apart from a <laughs> naked soldier? <laughs> so it was an immensely frustrating waste of time and effort for all parties involved in that question. So I think getting people familiar with the technology and then being comfortable as an organisation about where your boundaries are within that. And then most importantly, once you've got that blessing from the senior team, be it a chief exec or be it a board or preferably both, then just let people get on with it and get the generation in that feel very comfortable with those technologies. And that, as I say that, as a, a middle-aged manager of large organisations, you've just got to let go because those 20-somethings know way more than I will ever know about social media. They've grown up in it in a completely natural environment. It's a completely instinctive environment. And what you need to do is help support them to create amazing stuff. So I think in a, in a small charity, if you don't have any of those kind of people, go and make friends with them. And if you do bring them into the organisation, make sure they've got the space to go and experiment and don't stamp on their heads when they make mistakes ask if they can learn from that process and how that might sort of further it. And it's a really tricky, but I think it's a managerial challenge. It's not a go and buy this piece of technology or let's all go and make um, YouTube videos because there are better people usually than ourselves to, to do all of those things. So that's how I would, I would start that conversation. Oh, I just want to have a little smaller charities. And yeah, just, just a little bit of a, uh, an add-on to the point about involving trustees. I think it is, is really important. You need to maybe, particularly at smaller charities, I used to work at a charity which had, I was one of 10 people that worked there. Um, and the board gets a lot more involved in day-to-day -day business in, in that sort of respect. So maybe pick the right trustee to get involved and get them on side. Um, you don't necessarily want uh, all of the trustees getting involved in every single tweet that you have to send out. So I think you get, you're right, you need to get them on board, but I think it's just about making sure you get them involved on your terms if you can. Um, I think, yeah, for small charities particularly. So. Um, I guess from my point of view, it's just uh, absolutely giving up a bit of control, but um, giving up control in the sense that you're able to uh, spot things that maybe aren't necessarily linked to your brand, but um, that you can that you can kind of find a way to, to make about your brand. So um, looking out for what the audience wants. I think no matter what size of charity you are, you can always keep an eye on what your community is talking about what people are, are doing and what they're saying and and then kind of creating content or, or joining the conversation with them but letting them kind of drive it so giving up that control and letting the community and, and the audience help decide the path that you're going to take. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Yes. The question is for Henry, does will Giving Tuesday take off in the UK where we're not quite so familiar with um, Black Monday, um, Black Friday, and <laughs> there we go, proof. <laughs> I'll let Henry answer. Um, I'll refer you to my previous answer, it's kind of up to you. Um, did we, I think it will, and I'll tell you why. The Cyber Monday is going to be, it was big last year, it wasn't, it wasn't enormous, but it was big, it's it's going to be huge. I mean, but Cyber Monday and Black Friday are going to come into the UK retail market. This is a prediction, not a fact, but I think it's a safe one in a very significant way. So the question then, I think, to the charitable sector is not, is this going to work? The question for the charitable sector is, is there something here we can take advantage of, right? If the retail world can come together, work out how to tell collective stories to mutual, to mutual benefit, how can the charitable sector do that too is an interesting question. And so the question is, is Cyber Monday and um, uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, are they really essential for Giving Tuesday? In Israel last year, Giving Tuesday was the best, uh, the, the highest online giving day in the history of Israel, with no Black Friday, no Cyber Monday, no Thanksgiving. Right? Simply just saying it's Giving Tuesday, we're going to be united by this. Um, 
created that energy and that enthusiasm and then led to that kind of impact. So I suspect that uh, we actually thought when we began this, we thought it would never leave America because we thought it was tied to Thanksgiving. But actually what became clear in Canada, Canada last year, which has a real influence of Black Friday and Cyber Monday, Giving Tuesday did very well. I think it will work this year in countries even where there aren't Cyber Monday. I think actually what will happen is there will be happening in enough countries that you'll just see it's Giving Tuesday, assume that's the thing and respond to it. Um, because there's one thing which I really took from today's sessions, is you look at how quickly interest peaked and then went away behind the no makeup selfies, right? There are these moments, and if we can manufacture a moment, right, that would be a very powerful idea. So I hope that's something which Giving Tuesday UK will work on this year. Thank you, Henry. Any more questions? Any more ideas for Charity Tuesday, for Giving Tuesday UK? Anyone got any plans already to take advantage of it and build it? My okay. mother is having a coffee morning. Okay, Henry's <laughs> mother, mother has got a coffee morning. Okay, I'm going to say thank you very much indeed for everyone coming today and for those watching online as well. The conversation will continue via the hashtag um, of Giving Tuesday UK. Um, thank you very much to Blackboard Europe for hosting us in their offices in central London. Thank you very much to Charities Aid Foundation um, for making this event possible as well. Thank you everyone for coming um, and thank you in particular for our speak to our speakers, Henry Timms, Aaron Eccles, Dominic Vallely and Gareth Ellis Thomas. Should we thank them in the customary way? So make a date in your diary for Giving Tuesday. It's the first Tuesday of December, which this year falls on 2nd of December. There will be plenty more events around the country in the run-up to that, so that you can find out more and how your charity can get involved, and organisations that you're involved with can get involved. And go and explore the Giving Tuesday website um, in the UK to find out ideas and other opportunities to find out how you can get involved. I certainly welcome the appearance of Giving Tuesday in the UK. I can remember back to just about 10 years ago and the giving campaign. You might think the UK population, despite um, their charitable record, don't need another reminder to give. As a fundraiser, I know it's important to ask at every appropriate opportunity. So I think they do need reminding of it. And there was um, coverage this morning or re research from Charities Aid Foundation which said that for those people who are experiencing the upturn in the economy, charity was, not, was well down their list of items that they would be spending their increased availability of money on. So we can't assume that charity will suddenly, instantly take off whenever the economy takes off for, for more people. So I think an opportunity like Giving Tuesday, particularly when it's based on collaboration and not one big organisation with its central platform dominating it all, where it is open to being used and creatively misused in a, in a good way. To me, I think that's quite a, a valuable opportunity. We heard from the speakers about the importance of testing, of creativity, so I see this as another really good opportunity, an excuse if you need it, to test and try out new fundraising ideas and watching what everyone else is up to. So I wish Giving Tuesday in the UK lots of success. We'll certainly be reporting on it on UK fundraising. And thank you very much indeed for coming to Making Giving Social. Thank you.